Now we're going to have a conversation about CSOs and the roles they have played in ensuring that the vulnerable in society are cared for, especially during this COVID-19 pandemic, uh, especially for people who have no one to speak for them and unfortunately have been sidelined in some of the policies that have been put out there. So what are these CSOs doing? And this conversation, of course, is brought to you by Star Ghana. Joining us this morning in the studios, I have Noelle Apia. She's a project manager for FIDA. And Dr. James Dua is joining us via Zoom uh, from the Christian Health Association of Ghana. Good morning to you, Noelle. And Doc, good morning to you as well. And first of all, I want us to define who the vulnerable are. And of course, looking at your, uh, the role that you play, I believe that it would vary for you, Noel, and for doctors as well. So Noel, I'll start off with you. If we say vulnerable for FIDA, who do you consider vulnerable? Okay, so in our line of work, and when you talk about vulnerable, we talk about women, women with disability, and then women with, living with HIV and AIDS. Okay. Because each, of, each one of them has a peculiar need that needs to be addressed. Mm -hmm. So you don't make them a homogeneous group. I see. Yes. Because, um, for instance, in access to justice, when you talk about a deaf person, you think through its accessibility when you go to the police station to report accessibility to the court and all that. So each and every one of them has their own peculiar needs that needs to be addressed in assessing justice. And with this definition, is it more about COVID-19 or is it a general definition? If it's you get a, what I mean. Yes, I do. Okay. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's just a general definition. Okay. But again, like I said, they all have their peculiar needs. Before mm. COVID, they need access to justice. During COVID, they still do. Mm. Yes, but um, what has happened in COVID is that um, during the lockdown and then the restrictions, and they were, they were all staying in the house with, let's say, um, I'm talking from the angle of domestic violence, increasing mm -hmm. it. They were staying with their abusers. Those who abused them were all locked down in the house, and so there were issues. And then during the restrictions and then um, lockdown, they didn't know where to, especially access justice, who to call, mm -hmm. where to go to. Mm -hmm. So that is why they are more vulnerable um, during this COVID pandemic. Absolutely. Let me bring Dr. Jia in to also define who he calls vulnerable uh, for us. And of course, what situations will determine who is vulnerable at what point? Dr. Jia. Right. Um, good morning. morning. Thank you for having me on the call. Let me say that um, when we stay vulnerable people to us as health workers, I think um, in this pandemic, all health workers are vulnerable. Mm. And um, the reason is, is simple because you, first, they are the frontline workers. They are receiving all manner of people from our environment. Uh, people who are coming to them, whether they are symptomatic, and when I say symptomatic, people who are coming with uh, things that really you can see that this person is suffering from this illness or not. Mm -hmm. And there are people who also apparently seem normal without anything to show that this person is sick. They are all coming to the hospital environment. And one of the things that we have recognized in this, um, in this pandemic is the fact that, I mean, if you take a case of Ghana, you have so many people who have tested positive who don't have any of the symptoms that we talk about, whether it is cough or runny nose or fever. Mm -hmm. There are so many people in that situation. And these are people who are visiting you in the hospital environment and you don't know whether they have COVID or not. So it makes them very, very, very vulnerable. Now, a second group of people who are vulnerable that, I mean, we consider are the people who are living in rural areas okay. um, by, I mean, either our family setting and um, the way we need, we live, communal living, mm -hmm. um, by our socioeconomic standards, our housing, our choice of housing. Uh, there are places where people, there are more people living in under one roof, people living in one room. So these are people who are really vulnerable. And then let me take it generally. In terms of, um, if you take Ghana, for instance, we are saying that there are some regions that are hotspots. There are others that are not because the case counts are low. Yeah. In those regions where the case counts are low, we classify people living in those regions as really, really vulnerable because 
when you know you are aware that awareness gives you some level of precaution yeah when you are aware you are conscious of what to do because i know that i'm facing danger and naturally when you say that people from Accra, people in Kumasi, because the case count is high, when people are coming here, they are careful. And if you walk on the street, you find that many people are putting on face masks. Mm -hmm. There's generalized use of alcohol based hand sanitizer. But if you go to the regions where the case count is low, people are not um, practicing those measures as yeah. we have here in the city. And it makes them really vulnerable because you don't know who you are meeting, who has the condition. Mm -hmm. You know. So these are three categories of people that we feel they are vulnerable. And then the, the fourth category has to do with officers who are in the front line. And here I'm not talking about front line workers, but people in offices that are directly involved in handling this COVID. Like if you take a place like Ministry of Health, I mean, the office cannot close down because of uh, this situation. It lies directly in their domain and so by all means they receive visitors there are so many things that they are doing meetings and all that okay that is the fourth group of people that we consider vulnerable i see now now i like that you broke it down for us but again let's talk about the peculiarities we've touched certainly on that so i'll come back to you noel tell me so when it comes to these people that you have mentioned women with disabilities women living with hiv and women in general because domestic violence is an issue that could affect every woman regardless what are these peculiar problems that have crept up as, as a result of COVID-19 that FIDA is addressing? So what FIDA is addressing, um, I'll start with um, giving a simple scenario. Okay. Um, on the 9th of the lockdown, I had a call from one of our community paralegals that a woman had called reporting abuse. Mm -hmm. And the husband had asked her to leave the house. This was but, prior to lockdown? No, so the night, so um, it was supposed to take effect like 12. Yes. So that was around 8, 9 o'clock. Okay. And then she has been asked out of the house. Hmm. So in that case, what happens? Mm -hmm. So immediately I had to report to the nearest police station. You know, it's around 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock. She definitely cannot sleep in the house. Yeah. And for the next two weeks, <laughs> we were not supposed to go anywhere. So in that case, Frida was like, so what can we do to help? Because I had a call. So then we thought through and we realized that then probably we need to make um, maybe technology more, um, use technology in this instance. So okay. what I had to do was to call, give advice as to what she has to do and all that for us to wait for the lockdown to be over for her to go back to the police station to report. So then, all that while she was still home? No, she had left. Okay. She had left. Okay. Because she couldn't stay because the... The husband has abused her and then asked her to step out of the house. Hmm. So she had to leave. But she has to find somewhere safe to stay. And you know, during lockdown, everybody's in the house. So mm -hmm. um, you don't know what you are bringing, the inconvenience and all that. So it was quite tough. And so those were the situations that we were faced during the lockdown for women. Who well, were well, talking a bit about domestic violence, do you have statistics to show how many of these women suffered violence during the lockdown and even during this pandemic? How many people have suffered violence? That is the issue. We don't have data. Okay. But then from the number of calls I got during the lockdown, it shows that even we are not saying there is no domestic violence at all, but we are saying that in these times, what do you do? Mm -hmm. Because we are restricted, services were restricted. There was one case that came that the husband had, they had the woman and the children had to virtually run out of the house. There were three children with a woman, four. You are going to a family, let's say, already with six children, they are already six. That means you are 10 in the house during lockdown. So quickly, we had to find a lawyer who applied for um, an occupation order for her. That took some time because the courts were not sitting regularly. You know, there were some restrictions in services. So mm -hmm. coupled with all that, you realize that um, we need to have a look at it, domestic violence uh, at a certain level so that we'll be able to respond promptly when there, there, there are issues. So I had to get a lawyer before. It took some time, more than two three weeks for the order to be given, for the man to be arrested. Hmm. And by that time, it's like four weeks, five exactly. weeks. Exactly. I mean, if you have to grapple with that whilst you wait for FIDA to step in and provide yes. support, how do you manage? And so in such instances, like you said, you had to rely heavily on technology yes. to support these women. Yes. How effective was that? It was. And, and because of our collaboration with, okay, again, the lawyers we have, and then the state actors, especially mm -hmm. DOSU, so in the first instance, um, the DOSU officers in that particular um, place she reported 
weren't being proactive with the issue. So I had to call another dorsal head to call. So, you know, we, because we have worked with them for some time, we have some kind of collaboration, okay. like, like sisters and brothers. So uh -huh. from um, the second case, it was a dorsal officer who called me. And because the dorsal officer had my number and could contact me to get a lawyer for the client because she moved out of the house with what she was just wearing. So mm. she went to that place virtually with nothing, and then she couldn't go back to the husband's house. So technology helped because, again, you need to get someone who is readily available to do the work. Yeah. So you have to make the calls and then use SMS, use WhatsApp to reach to your, um, the survivors and yeah. then um, the lawyers and then the those two officers who are um, there to help us. Now, away from women who suffer domestic violence, what about women with disabilities and women um, living with HIV? Because I remember there was a conversation we had with, uh, I think, the head of the HIV um, you know, organization here in Ghana, and they complained bitterly during the lockdown that they did not have the opportunity to go for their uh, drugs at the hospitals because there was a lockdown. Nobody was allowing anyone around, and they didn't even have the chits to show that I'm a special patient, so allow me to step out and get my medicine to stay alive. What were some of the challenges that you had to deal with yes. uh, with women who are living with HIV and with disabilities? Okay, so um, the women living with disability, again, we have community paralegals who are persons with disability. Mm. So they were able to quickly in the regions to assist their fellow um, persons with disability during this time, where they also have, um, under another um, one of our projects, we use SMS um, to bring justice to the doorstep. So okay. what, we, what we did was we had a lawyer on the platform, we had a dorsal officer, and then we had those paralegals, persons with disability paralegal group also on the platform. So in any case, quickly you just have to um, send an SMS message and then um, they will assist to give you direction as to what to do. Um, with the women living with HIV and AIDS, we didn't have much um, issues coming from them from the regions. Okay. Yes, but um, I understand where they are coming from because sometimes and there have been the stigma, so they don't like disclosing their status. Yeah. And other regions, um, they are okay, but some regions, the stigma is, is, is just too much for them. So don't be able to show you something that... Um, indicates. Yes, indicates mm. that um, this is, I need to, to go to the hospital to get my um, medicine. In any case, where we are working with the women living with HIV, they are also on the platform. So if they need any assistance, they could quickly um, get it on the platform. So there's a platform... Yes, for, for um, a, under a particular project that we are using. So this platform did not come about as a result of COVID-19? No, no, no. It's no, always we, existed? Uh, yes, it, it did. Okay. But, and then what we introduced during COVID-19 is that, you know, sometimes um, um, the people, the groups we deal with, um, there are barriers, barrier in um, sending messages. Mm -hmm. So what we did was a WhatsApp platform where they could do voice application. So they could send their um, message through voice and yeah. then quickly um, they will be attended to so that they are not restricted by um, maybe typing English or something. Yeah. I see. Dr. Dia, these four groups of people that you identified as vulnerable, for the Christian Health Association, how were you able to, or how have you been able to reach out to them to offer protection and, of course, offer support during this COVID-19 period? Because, again, indirectly they are marginalized. And so even though there were policies meant to pro protect everyone, maybe they were in as much protected. How did you manage as an association to provide support for such people? Right. Uh, thank you very much. So uh, we have been graciously supported by Star Ghana Foundation as one of the organizations to respond to this. And let me express Jack's appreciation to them. So the support that came from Star Ghana was to help our health workers in terms of um, giving out uh, a number of personal protective equipment. Mm. I mean, it is no news that across the world, not only in Ghana, um, there are shortages of PPEs that are required to respond to this COVID. So we had um, as part of the support um, to support our staff with um, PPEs. Mm -hmm. Again, um, we we have done a lot of training, uh, that is infection prevention and control training okay. for our, our health staff. And let me say that in this pandemic, because it is new, as, as people are saying, it's novel, there are a lot of unknowns. And uh, if you look at our health facilities, even though we talk about uh, water 
um, sanitation and hygiene in, in the community level. But if you take health facilities, we also have issues with um, IPC. And so the support came to help us to train our health workers in IPC. And so far we have done 960. We have quite a few to do. That have been very, very helpful because if you look at the statistics in terms of staff who were getting infected before and after the training, mm. it is very clear. It is very clear in some facilities you had as many as 100 people or plus having been infected with COVID. And after the training, this number has reduced to about 2018. And um, I think it's, it's, it's quite been helpful. Again, um, let me talk about the people uh, in communities, yeah. uh, rural communities, where, which is another group that we are handling. You are aware that even though the government has done tremendously well, um, in terms of the communication, mainly access to TV, radio, is key in, in getting the messages. But if you walk to many rural areas where ch child facilities are located, there are several people who don't have access to TV, mm -hmm. and several people who don't have access to radio. And even in terms of the information, how do people translate it? Yeah. Somebody said the messages are only in English. How do we understand? We see the body language, we see all mm. that, but how do we even understand? And so a core part of our response, supported by Star Ghana, had to do with development of um, social behavioral change communication materials, what we usually call IEC materials. Mm -hmm. And these materials were developed on five thematic areas. One, prevention and control. Um, two, stigma, discrimination. There's an element on fear and anxiety. I mean, that has gripped the whole nation. People fear, even health workers yeah. fear. And then domestic violence and abuse. All these were taken into consideration and translated into IEC materials. Now, we have not just done this IEC material, but importantly, what we are doing is to take these messages, essential messages, into the homes okay. of the people. You are aware that around this time, um, I'm sure your, your, your television has showed a number of places where people are not visiting the health facilities. Mm -hmm. So important groups like pregnant women, people with non-communicable diseases, and rightly so because of the fear and anxiety that has characterized um, health facilities. And so we use this support from Star Ghana to reach out to 50,000 households. Okay. So we take the, the messages, we go to their homes, and the, the important thing is that it gives us the opportunity to talk about COVID in a way and language that they understand. Mm -hmm. It also affords us the opportunity to explain. So when we say social distancing, when we say hand hygiene, what does it mean to the local person? If yeah. the person doesn't speak, let's say, English or the language that, I mean, that is used to communicate via radio and TV, we get opportunity to explain. Again, we also get opportunity to talk about other important health matters, essential health matters, like pregnant women who are not visiting the hospital because of fear mm -hmm. and anxiety. We get to address their issues and we get to connect those who need care to the hospital environment. In a way, this procedure helps us to address the issues of stigma that has characterized the health environment. It allows us to also address issues of um, non-communicable diseases and also address any questions that they may have when they don't get opportunity to to ask. Absolutely. So, yeah, these are these are some of the things that we have done with uh, Star Ghana support. Yeah. Okay, okay, and and I'm sure that you also had the opportunity to liaise with state officials, like you said, so we don't duplicate some of these, uh, you know, supports that we've provided for the vulnerable in society. How responsible, well, responsive actually has states been in supporting your work? And we'll just touch on this briefly. So we can wrap up. Um, the state has been very responsive. Like I said, we have been working with those who for, for quite a long time. So mm. we have that collaboration. So it's just a phone call away and then um, you, you get access to justice for the survivor. I see. Yes. Okay. Anyway, this is all time we're alive. I wish we could go on about a lot of the other things that 
um, you know, the policies that have been put in place. But, of course, thank you so much for speaking to us this morning. And we hope that a lot more can be done, uh, especially for these vulnerable groups as well. So I've been speaking to Noel. Um, let me get her correct name so that yeah noel appears as a project manager for fida and dr james Dria is a christian health association of ghana member and they've been speaking on the role of cso's in coordinating support for vulnerable citizens